Hey, good morning. My name is Travis. You might remember me from uh, about 30 seconds ago when I was talking to you about something else. <laughs> it's good to, good to be here in the Great Hall. It is great. It's a great place. Um, we are uh, in a new series. Uh, last week we started uh, talking about uh, truth in an age of falsehood, and this week uh, we're talking about weakness in an age of strength. And it's part of this series uh, about uh, a paradox, right? Living in a paradox uh, together. And, and some of you might wonder, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, paradox, part of living in a paradoxical life is that, that the culture around us, although not good nor bad, it's neutral. We are a part of the culture around us as well, just by existing in our country and in our world. Uh, but sometimes the culture that we live in will call us to live in a way, will say that it is good to live in a way that is contrary to what Scripture has told us to live, contrary to what Jesus has taught. And so in that moment, we kind of live in this paradox. And if you want to know if you're living there, you start feeling tension. You feel the pull of culture around you. And at the same time, you're like, but I don't know that I can go that route. I don't know that that's what the gospel calls me to do. I don't know that, that what my faith will allow me to do that. When you feel that tension, that's the paradox at work. That's the paradox in play. And so again, as we were uh, working on this week, talking about this week, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, strength, weakness in, in an age of strength. I began to think about symbols of power. And one of the great symbols of power throughout history is this. You have two of them. A hand. What we do with our hands is a symbol of strength. And even we've used hands on banners and on posters and even together in, in groups as emblems of strength, right? The Black Power Movement has an upheld fist to show solidarity and strength, right? It's literally black power. In a, in a negative example of this, you go to, to the 1930s and 40s in Nazi Germany, an entire group of people to show that they were unified and, and, and all about themselves extended a hand up towards a flag, up to a leader. Even in our society today, advertising has adopted this. If you, some of you are insured by a company that wants you to be what? In good hands with Allstate. I'm, I don't have the voice that guy does. I wish I did. But they're telling you that you, you're going to come alongside you in your darkest hour, in your di most difficult time. We're strong enough as a company to hold you up. That's what they're trying to tell you. And even in our church, throughout history, when you've wanted somebody to pray, what do we do? Put your hands together. Those of you that are parents, small children, you don't know it. Because you, sometimes you can't tell your kids to pray, right? Because they just can't say that. So you're like... <laughs> right? Like the snapping's not disruptive, right? <laughs> but Megan said something that, that really resonated with me. And it's this idea that, that we're, we're, we're told to lay hold of. We're, to, we're told to take things into our own hands, right? We're told to be captain of our own vessel, right? To lay your own hands upon the wheel of your life and, and be in command. We're told to, to seize life by the horns, right? I think that's actually a Dodge advertisement, right? We're told to take control. And the world wants you to do that because the world believes that's the best way to go about living your life. But the scriptures teach us in 1 Timothy that there's actually a better way to do it. That weakness is actually the pathway to strength. Surrender is the pathway to strength, to power. So we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And I just want us to look at two things that we can do to strengthen our hands in the way that honors Christ and that helps others as well. So the first thing is powerful hands will make peace. Powerful hands make peace. So Paul has just finished talking about how he was rescued from God, or rescued by God, excuse me, from a life of pursuing legalism and persecution of the church. And now he's encouraging Timothy to be in prayer as Timothy is leading this church at Ephesus. So Timothy's his protege, he's taking over this congregation in Ephesus. And so that is what Paul has called him to do. And he says, all kinds of prayers, all kinds of people, that's what we're gonna have at the church in Ephesus. And it says in verse one, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now there's four words here for prayer. Now you can run with this if you want. Some, some commentators do. Uh, they, they, they attach a specific nuance to each one. Other commentators are like, eh, Paul just might be being literary here. And, and rather than saying pray, 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 he's using some different words to encourage prayer. Either way you go, there is a little bit of nuance uh, between the words. 
uh, the first word, which is supplications, is always used in reference to God. And it's asking for a specific thing. So it's not just like, oh, Lord, help us today. It's, oh, Lord, I've got a presentation today. I need help. That's a, that's a supplication. It's a specific request to God. The second word is prayer. Prayer is a more general term for prayer. But when it's used together with some other terms, it can take on the, 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 cog, uh, the cognitive, what's the word I'm looking for? The implication, excuse me, that, uh, that intercession is going on. That God is interceding, or that we're interceding on behalf of others. The third word there is intercession. Now, you might be like, well, Travis, you just said. The intercession here word is a lot more intense than, oh, Lord, Aunt Becky has a bunion, and please help her, because I'm tired of hearing about it. That's not the intercession that we're talking about. Intercession is receiving um, news about somebody else and taking on their burden as if it were your own. Like you are passionately praying to God. You're appealing to God as if this was your own problem, as if it was your life on the line. So I had a friend this week, as I was working on this, uh, share with me that his wife's just kind of going through a difficult season right now. She's okay, but just ask me to pray. And so I said, great, I will. And then I, as, I, as I was working on this, I was like, I need, to be, I need to pray for her. And so I texted him the next morning. I was like, hey, man, I just want to let you know, like I'm learning this right now, and I want you to know I'm praying for her as if she were my own wife, as if it was my own marriage. Like, that's how I'm going about this. And it's been hard. It's been very intense. And then the last word is thanksgiving. Whenever we pray to God, it should be accompanied with thanksgiving. We should be grateful. We don't just ask God for things and then move on. No, we should be grateful. And the cool thing about being followers of Jesus is there's a whole host of people out there who have an immeasurable amount of blessing from the Lord. Just the very breath in their lung is a blessing from God. And you know what happens? They don't acknowledge him at all. And so as the people of God, we get to go to him on their behalf and say, Lord, I know there are people that do not acknowledge you. I know there are people who have such great blessings and they haven't thanked you once for them. And so on their behalf, thank you for what you've poured out in their lives. Now use it, please, Lord, to lead them to you. Now that changes things a whole lot when you see somebody, your neighbor pull up in a brand new car or somebody get a brand new house, somebody achieve something that you want. And rather than being jealous and envious, we go to the Lord on their behalf and we say, Lord, thank you for blessing them. Now please use it for your glory and their benefit. It changes things. And Paul tells us that we're supposed to offer these different kinds of prayers, these four prayers, for all kinds of people. He wants all kinds of people to be prayed for. And then he gives us a specific example. Look at verse two. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. We pray for our rulers. Pray for our leaders. Why? Because we want peace. We want peace. So if you're wondering what to pray for a leader, particularly maybe even a leader that you don't like, Lord, pray that you would give them wisdom so that he or she might rule, that we might have peace. Now, why? Why does he want peace? Because when you have peace, we thrive physically and we thrive spiritually, which is interesting because I think uh, as long as I've been in church, I've been taught that when the church was persecuted, she grew really fast. She grew well. And that's true. There's some truth to that, right? God works all kinds of seasons. But here, Paul is very distinctly saying, look, when the church is at peace, when she's not having to worry about persecution, she can concentrate on growing and maturing. And we can live healthily and well, right? So as we're praying, as we're praying for people this week, as you're interceding on their behalf, I want you to go and look at Colossians uh, 4, 2 through 6. You don't have to do that now. Just read it this week. Kind of maybe memorize it, maybe spend some time in it, just marinating in it, and intercede. Pray for other people. We're all going to do that this week. Now, on a macro level, that's, that's kind of praying for peace. But on a micro level, in your interpersonal relationships, we also need to pray that peace would reign in our personal lives, right? One of the reasons why we feel powerless in our society is because we try to use the weapons, the, the abilities, the means that the world around us uses rather than the things that God has taught us to do. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, uh, football. In football, football is a great game because there's a lot of different ways that you can win. Some coaches will get in there and say, I want the biggest, I want the meanest, I want the strongest guys, and we're going to push everybody off the ball and we're going to bully them. I don't know of any football coaches that talk like that, but I just made it up. <laughs> but then you have another coach who's like, no, 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 we're not going to win that way. I want small guys. I want fast guys. I want guys that are smart, and they're going to win by, by being uh, precise. And you know what happens? 
One of those teams gets into trouble when they start trying to play the way the other team, their opponent is playing, when they get out of their game, when they get out of the way that they're doing things. And we do this all the time. We see the world around us and they're like, wow, they've got a lot more power. They've got a lot more influence. We should do that as a group. We should, we should act like that. We should be like that. And we, all of a sudden, we stop being true to our God who's made us to be a certain way. And especially once we've been redeemed, he, he desires that we live in a certain way. He's given us tools and abilities, spiritual gifts to leverage on the good of the kingdom. And we, we set those aside. We don't pray. We don't fast. We don't do those things because we were so focused on winning the way everybody else is winning. And it doesn't work. And then we're frustrated. We're frustrated with God. We're frustrated with the world around us. We're like, why isn't it working for us? Because it's not meant to. It's not designed to work for you. That's not the way you've been built. But it's not just a, our subculture versus their subculture thing. It's a you versus another individual kind of thing. We're always at war. We're on a war footing with people around us, right? We're so worried that we're gonna lose the things that we've gained or we're, we're gonna miss out on opportunities to get even more, right? And so in, in, our, in our homes, right, we might have a, a time with our roommate where we're not getting along with them. I went through a season like that. I didn't get along with the roommate that I was living with. It wasn't my wife, don't worry. But for some of you, that is your spouse. You guys aren't getting along right now. And you're on a war footing. The slightest thing is going to set off World War III, and then World War IV, and then V, and then VI. And that's just a Saturday. <laughs> your kids, the people around you, your coworkers, your brothers, your sisters. We are a people who have taken our hands. And rather than training them for this, we've trained them for war. We train them for fighting. We've got to stop using our hands for that, and we've got to start using our hands for prayer. And it's what it says in verse 8. Skip down there. We'll come back to the rest. Verse 8. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. The men are so busy fighting, maybe physically, maybe just arguing, that they've stopped doing their primary functions, stopped praying, they stopped leading the congregation, leading the church in prayer. These are public prayers. They're so busy going to war all the time that they've forgotten to pray. They've forgotten to pray. God calls us to be different. And one of the ways he shows us this is back in Isaiah 2. Now you can turn over there if you'd like. Um, I'll read it to you, Isaiah 2. It's one of my favorite passages. Starting in verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And look at this. He shall judge between the nations, and he shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah is talking about a time in the future for him. And it's sort of in the future for us. We already, live, we already get to share in it a bit now. But there'll be a time when Christ returns and all of a sudden there won't be a need for war anymore. There won't be a need for conflict. And the Lord will rule and reign and be in control. And in some ways we get to experience this now. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're secure. You are safe in him. You don't have to fight anymore. You don't have to defend yourself anymore. You have to defend what's yours. And so you can take those things, those giftings that you have, those abilities, those tools that you're really good at, that nobody, nobody does it better than you do, right? So if you're, a, if you're a, a person who makes money and you're good at making money, you're a businessman, businesswoman, typically what we do is what do we do? We use it to make more money. You're somebody who's a high achiever. You've got degree after degree or certification after certification, and you use that to do what? Leverage more power and more control. Some of us have different tools. For me personally, it's my mouth. It always has been. It's always running. And I found that I value being quick-witted. I value a laugh. And I find that sometimes that leads to cutting remarks and wounds on people around me because of my insecurities. And so I use my mouth not always for edification, not always for growth of other people, but to tear people down so that I get to be up. We all have a gift. We all have a tool, and very often we use it, we leverage it for our own benefit and our own strength, our own gain of power and control. And what Isaiah 2, 2 through 4 is saying is, look, there's going to come a day, and there now is a day when we can take our weapons, our swords, our, our, our spears, 
my mouth, and I don't have to use it anymore as an offensive or a defensive weapon. I can use it and make it into a farming implement. That's what plowshares and pruning hooks were. It's a farming, it's for cultivation, it's for growth, it's for maturity, it's for taking somebody else and raising them up. Those little kids that we just watched, you have gifts and abilities that are designed to grow them more into the image of Christ. And we are to leverage them for them and for each other and for the glory of God. Whatever it is that you use to make yourself more powerful, you're, you should pray and intercede for that gift on, on its behalf and say, Lord, I've got this thing that you've given me. And Lord, I've twisted it and Satan has twisted it and sin has twisted it and I use it to, to the, the, the harm of others or for my own personal benefit. That's not always bad. The harm thing is, but not the, the benefit. But Lord, I want to use it for your glory. I want to use it for your kingdom. I want it to be something. I want it to be a farming implement. I want it to be something that grows people around me. I want it to be a weapon of peace, a tool of peace. That's what I want. So how are you going to use your gift? So what I plan on doing this week is for me, again, words are kind of my thing. I'm going to take a pen because pen, words, those kind of go together. And I'm going to pray this week about my gift, my, my words, right, and what I say, what comes out of my mouth, what's written in an email, what's written in a text, what I say next week in a sermon. And I'm going to offer up a pen to God each day and be like, Lord, with my words. So whatever is your thing, whatever represents like your gift, your ability, maybe it's a business card, maybe it's a stethoscope if you're a doctor, maybe, maybe it's a tool that you use on a regular basis, maybe it's your computer, your phone, offer that to the Lord and say, Lord, use this. And don't let, let it be a, a tool for war but one for peace. Use my hands for peace. Use the gifts you've given me for peace because powerful hands bring peace because powerful hands lay hold of powerful tools to bring peace and to bring growth and flourishing and thriving. Powerful hands bring peace, but they also bring freedom. They also bring freedom. Look at verse three. This is good. Peace is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our savior, who desires that all people be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men and the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul tells us why he wants us to be at peace. Because it pleases God. It makes God happy. And he says, because there are people of which we were at one time these people, who are far from God, who are enslaved to their sin, enslaved to the brokenness, in rebellion against God, the one true God, as Paul describes him. And they couldn't do anything to save themselves. They were powerless. They were weak. And so God sends his son, a mediator, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to die for us, that we might be brought into a relationship with him through faith. Rather than relying on ourselves, we rely on him. We trust in his work and his power and his strength to set us free. And then Paul says, this is my job, and I'm not lying about it. My job is to make sure every single person I run into knows this story. They know the truth. They know the truth because powerful hands bring freedom. Paul is leveraging his gift to set people free. That's what he wants. He is on a life mission to bring people free, uh, to bring people freedom. Paul has basically gone to war, but a war of liberation. One of the things we like to do as a country is we like to, to look on our wars that we've been in and we look at them as wars of liberation, right? Like the American Revolution, right? We set ourselves free from those awful British with their tea. We drink coffee now. Ha! We still haven't paid you back for all that stuff we dumped in the harbor either. And you move forward in history, right? Civil War. Union Army sets free the slaves. World War I, World War II, back-to-back -back World War champions, by the way. <laughs> Liberating Europe twice. You're welcome, Europe. And that's how we like to color our wars. There are wars of liberation, wars of freedom. And we, we translate this into our culture. If you are a person who has a gifting, who has an ability, who has a strength, and you use it to pour into other people, to help other people, it's seen as very popular. It's, it's like a good thing, right? It's, oh, that's so good of you. They're so generous. They're a philanthropist. Right? Here's the problem. We can pour, uh, and this is ironic considering I also was talking earlier about how important resources are. Resources are important. But unless they are accompanied with the message of the gospel, 
they ultimately will not set people free from the things that they are enslaved to. Because here's the problem. Punching, kicking, fighting, guns, bullets, knives are never going to liberate people from the thing that truly enslaves them, which is sin, death, and evil. And so if our weapons aren't going to set people free from that, what do we have that actually is going to do that? And it's prayer. It's prayer. We go to the Lord and we intercede, right? We get on our behalf as if it's our own life in jeopardy, as if it's our own enslavement. We say, Lord, please set these people free. I've got this coworker. I've got this friend. I've got this family member. I've got this brother, this sister. I've got this parent. I've got this guy in the cubicle next to me. Set them free. And there's three things this passage tells us about that we can do, that we can remember as we're praying. Verse four, first we need to remember God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So when I read this, all people, all kinds of people is kind of how I read it. So God wants people from all different groups, right? So he wants people from Africa, from India. He wants people uh, that are old, that are young. He wants people who smell good, who don't smell good. God wants all kinds of people to come to know him. And you know who falls in the all kinds of people category? Me. You. And so I need to remember when I read this verse, it's not talking about other people. It's talking about me. And so when I go in prayer and I say, Lord, so-and-so is enslaved, to, he's addicted to this, or, or he doesn't know you, Lord, he doesn't come to know you, what happens is I forget sometimes that at one time I too was enslaved. At one time I was an enemy of the Lord. And I've been brought into fellowship by Jesus Christ. And so my hands at one time were bound. I may not have known it at the time, but they were. And so when you pray for somebody this week, when you lift up that person who you want so desperately to be free of the thing, put your hands together. Put your hands just like this and say, Lord Jesus, this is how they are. This is their posture. Set them free. Break their chains. They can't do it. They can't break their chains. Remember that at one time that was you and he set you free. And I set other people free as well. So we need to remember need to remember, we also need uh, to sacrifice, to sacrifice. Look at verse five. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The way that we have been set free, the way that our bonds were broken, is by Christ giving himself as a ransom. Now, the cool word, the word for ransom here is really cool. It doesn't mean just like paying off somebody, right? So like when you're a kid and you broke something in a store and your, your parents would be like, all right, how much do they owe? And you have to give them. Some of y'all were like, kid, like that happened to me last week. Um, that's not what Paul is talking about here. There's a prefix on the word ransom in the Greek. And it means instead of, instead of. So the way that Christ paid our ransom was not just to pay off our debt, but was actually take the punishment for us. He took our place. That's, that's literally, it's a substitution is what he's done. And so rather than us suffering, or rather than us paying the penalty for our sins, Christ pays it for us by himself undergoing the, pun, the penalty, the punishment. And so Christ takes on this position of ultimate weakness. You want to talk about weakness? You want to talk about looking weak? Spread your hands out like this. There's no other more vulnerable position than this. I'm completely defenseless right now. And then take this position and have somebody force your hands to stay like this for hours on end because you're nailed to a piece of wood. And the whole time you're nailed to a piece of wood, people walk by and say, what a joke you are. You said you were powerful. You said you could save people and you can't even save yourself. How weak are you? But you know why Jesus adopts this posture of weakness? Because we couldn't. Our hands are here. We couldn't spread our arms out. We can't spread our hands out because we're in bondage, we're enslaved. But he can, because he wasn't enslaved. And so now, when you trust in Christ, guess what happens? Now, his arms are still stretched out, but they're not stretched out because they're on a cross. No, his arms are stretched out because he wants to give you the biggest cosmic hug ever. He wants to embrace you in his arms. One of my favorite songs, we sing it in the, in the chapel, we sing it in uh, sanctuary all the time. I will arise and go to Jesus, and he will what? Embrace me in his arms. And in the arms of my dear Savior, there are 10,000 charms. Christ's arms are like this for you. Will you run to him? Will you go to him? Will you be embraced by him? 
And once you become embraced by him, guess what? That then sets our arms free to do this. We now can open our hands. We can now open our arms and be vulnerable with people. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Jesus has got my back. Jesus has got me covered. I am secure in the Lord. I can be vulnerable. I can, be, I can take risks for the gospel. I don't have to worry about hoarding everything I have. I don't have to be on a war footing all the time because I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my arms can be like this. And I can be vulnerable with people around me. I can, I can love them without risk to myself because ultimately I'm secure in him. And so this week, as you're interceding for people, as you're praying for them, set your hands like this. Move from this to this and say, Lord, how can I sacrifice for the needs that they have? What can I do that makes your truth, your love for them more real? How can I be your arms? How can I embrace them? So we remember we sacrifice. And the last thing we do is we've got to be honest. Verse 7, be honest. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul had a problem. Uh, he had a hard time getting people to actually believe he was an apostle. Uh, when you didn't pal around with Jesus in the early days and you persecuted the church, I can understand why that was a little bit of a hurdle to climb. And so Paul, in pretty much every letter, uh, kind of declares himself to be an apostle. And sometimes he will even say, like... I really have the same authority as Peter. I have the same authority as John. And then here he says, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. Now, in our culture, when we want to want somebody to believe us, what do we do with our hand? We do this. I'm telling the truth. I promise. I swear, right? If you're a Boy Scout, you do something else. I wasn't, so I won't. Scout's honor, right? In our culture, you put your hand on a Bible, right? And you say, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Honest. Honest is critical. Honesty in our culture is valued, but only if you can control the honesty, right? So like people want to show and be real on Instagram and real on social media, but nobody is so real that they post like the food poisoning, like them curled up on a ball in the bathroom floor. Nobody's that real because it doesn't get you anything. We value honesty and vulnerability as long as it's a means to an end. But the scriptures say, no, 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 you will be honest, you will be authentic, you will be real with the people around you. Because in so doing, you will show that you have faith and trust in the Lord. Because you're real with him and you're honest with him. So as you're praying for other people, as you're remembering and as you're sacrificing, be honest. Be honest in your prayers for them. Be honest in your prayers with the Lord. Say, God, I'm coming before you and I don't want to pray right now. Lord, I'm coming before you right now and I don't like this person. Hey, you're irritating right now. Lord, I'm coming to you and I'm at war with this person. But I don't want to be. Or maybe I do want to be and I want you to do something to help me. We have been given a great gift. And it is a gift that makes us very, very powerful, but we sometimes refuse to use it. It's the gift of prayer. It's the gift of intercession. It's praying for other people on their behalf. And in doing so, we take on, we have powerful hands. Interestingly enough, we have powerful hands by letting go of control and giving that control to God. And it helps to make peace. It helps to build up. It helps to encourage. And we can use our gifts to build up and grow other people. And then when we pray for them, we remember, we sacrifice. And we be honest. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us, that we carry around with us everywhere we go, two reminders that you have called us to faith. And every time we see something, every time we lay hold of something, Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we are to lay hold of only what you've called us to lay hold of. And above all else, Lord, to lay hold of you in prayer, to plead and to beg and to seek your face and to say, Lord, if you will, Please act on this person's behalf and on this person's behalf and on this person's behalf and on my behalf as well. And Lord, the great thing is that you are a God who is more than willing. You want to hear from us. You're not hard to reach. And so Lord, I pray that you would put in our hearts, in each of our hearts, this desire to pray and to lay hold of you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.